Hello, my friend. I am so glad that you joined us today. Take your Bible, turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, and we're going to go to chapter 1. We'll read verses 1 through 4. 2 Samuel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Follow along. It came to pass after the death of Saul, when David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had stayed two days in Ziklag. And on the third day, behold, it happened that a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. And so it was when he came to David that he fell to the ground and prostrated himself. And David said to him, Where have you come from? And so he said, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. And then David said to him, How did the matter go? Please tell me. And he answered, The people have fled from the battle. Many of the people are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. I, I want to talk to you for the next few minutes on the subject dealing with grief. How do we navigate our way through the grieving process, dealing with grief. You know, there are words that when spoken can turn your world upside down. They can blot out the sun and, and make time stand still, or at least seems that way. Words like when the policeman comes and says, I'm sorry, he didn't survive the accident. Or, or when the doctor comes and says, I am so sorry, I did all I could do. I did all I could do, I'm sorry. In our text, David knows that King Saul and his son Jonathan are in a fierce battle with the Philistines and he's been waiting for someone to come from the battlefront to give him news of how the battle is progressing. And an Amalekite comes and brings him that news. David asked him, how's the battle going? And the report wasn't good. He said that many of the people have fled the battle. They're run away. And those who didn't run away, they're dead. And Saul and Jonathan, they're dead also. Man, those words were like a slap across the face to David. At first, he didn't believe the Malachite, and he demanded proof from him. Prove to me that Saul and Jonathan are dead. But when the Amalekite handed David Saul's crown and his bracelet, David had his proof. They were indeed dead. And as the reality of Saul's and Jonathan's death began to settle in on David, he felt the full weight of his grief. Saul, God's chosen and anointed king, the leader of Israel, he's dead. Jonathan, his best friend, is dead. It's real. They are dead. You know, at one time or another, we all experience the heavy weight of grief. And if you haven't, you will. We've all experienced it. We've experienced it in emergency rooms. We've experienced it in children's hospitals. We've experienced it at the scene of an accident. And for sure, we've experienced the weight of grief in cemeteries. And just like it was with David, we only have two options of how we can deal with our grief. We can run away and try to escape having to deal with our grief, or we can do as David did, stand and face our grief. Sadly, many people try to run away. They try to escape having to deal with their grief. They work harder. They change the subject. They drink harder. They avoid the subject. They get themselves busy as they can get. They, they just do anything that it takes 
to try and escape the reality and the reminders of death. There's a word, the word bereavement, and it's used in reference to someone who's working their way through the grieving process. Now, the word bereavement comes from the root word reeve. And the root word reeve means to take away by force, to plunder, and to rob. My friend, that's what death does to us. It robs us of moments and memories that are yet to be shared. It robs us of of anniversaries and birthdays and weddings and vacations, and the list goes on. When you lose a loved one, you're bereaved because you have been robbed. And nothing in your life is normal anymore. And truth be told, it probably never will be again because of this loss. And just about the time that you think you have a handle on your grief, something triggers a memory. And you feel the weight of grief all over again. Perhaps it was a song that you heard. Or maybe you drove by a favorite restaurant. Or maybe it was the smell of a particular cologne or or perfume. Whatever the trigger was, grief assaulted you again and stirred up your emotions over and over and over again. And when you start dealing with your grief at that level, listen, you already know this. I'm not about to tell you something that you don't know. You know grief steals your sleep. You know that grief steals your appetite. It steals your sense of well-being. It steals your peace of heart and peace of mind. You know that. And then grief brings anxiety and regret, anxiety. What am I going to do next? How is this going to, going to, what's life going to look like in my tomorrows? And regret, I wonder if there was anything I could have done or, or could have said that would have changed the outcome. And then grief fills your mind with questions, a lot of them. Among them is, why did this happen? Why me? Why now? And probably the biggest question of all is, God, where are you? Where are you in all of this? If we're going to successfully deal with our grief, we're going to have to realize that grief is not something you can ignore. It's not something that you can simply walk away from. At some point, You're going to have to do what David did. You're going to have to face your grief and give expression to your sorrow. When David heard the news of Saul and Jonathan's death, that's exactly what he did. He yielded to his grief. He gave in to it, and he wept openly. Listen to 2 Samuel 1, verse 11 and 12. Therefore David took hold of his own clothes and, and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son, for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. David tore his clothes as an expression of his grief, and his men did the same thing. And my friend, listen, when we're faced with grief, we need to do what David did. I'm not talking about tearing our clothes. That's That's an expression from a culture that's long gone. What what I'm talking about is we need to give expression to our sorrow. Can I just tell you, especially you men, it's okay to cry. It's okay to weep, to let your tears flow, and you don't have to do it in private. You can cry in public. It's okay. It's okay. See, actually, weeping is God's gift to those who are grieving. This is exactly what Jesus did when he stood beside the tomb of of his dear friend Lazarus. Lazarus was close to him, 
Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, they were all close. And they'd spent many, many times together. Listen to what John 11, verse 33 to 35 says. When Jesus did, uh, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, listen, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And then the Bible finishes that passage with Jesus wept. He was close to this family. He was close to Lazarus. He was a good friend. He had visited his home on many, many occasions. And by the time that Jesus arrives at the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, Lazarus has been dead and buried for four days. And when Jesus saw Mary and Martha weeping and mourning and, and the people that had gathered around them doing the same, it troubled his heart. The Bible says he groaned deep within himself. And he asked, where, where have you laid him? And they took him there. And as he stood, as he stood by Lazarus' tomb, he wept. Openly, publicly, he wept. You know, it kind of makes you wonder, though, why did Jesus weep? I mean, we know the rest of the story. We have that benefit. We know what was going to happen next. But so did Jesus. He knew that in just a few minutes, he was going to call for Lazarus to come out of his grave, and he would. So why the tears? He knew that in just a few hours, he would sit down at the table with Mary and Martha and his friend Lazarus, and they would enjoy each other's fellowship again. So why the tears? He knew that the tears of sorrow that were flowing from Mary and Martha's eyes in just minutes from now would be turned to tears of joy. They would embrace their brother living again. So why the tears? Well, I'll tell you what I believe. I believe he wept because death did to him what death does to us. It amputates a limb of our life. Someone that we're relational with, someone that we're connected to, someone that we love dearly, and when they die, they're cut off, they're amputated, they're separated from us, never to be joined on this side of heaven again. Jesus stood at the tomb, and he felt the heartache of that amputation of what death had done to Lazarus. And he wept. And my friend, in the tears of Jesus, we find permission to shed our own. It's okay. Now, we don't know how long Jesus wept at the tomb. We don't know how long David wept over Saul and, and Jonathan. The Bible is silent. It doesn't tell us. But oh my, we know how long we've been weeping. There's some days where it just seems like weeping is never going to come to an end. I want you to know David understands that. He felt that very same thing. He felt the devastation of his grief that released his tears. And some days were like yours. It seemed like he was never going to stop crying. Listen to what he says in Psalm chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. I am worn out from sobbing. All night I flood my bed with weeping, drenching it with my tears. My vision is blurred by my grief. Listen again to Psalms 31 and verse 10. David says, I'm, I'm dying from grief. My years are shortened by sadness. Sin has drained my strength. I'm wasting away from within. You know that feeling. You know, David might have used different words to describe his grief and to, to express his grief. But one thing we see for sure, David did not ignore it. He did not ignore it. He faced his grief 
with truth. Honestly, he faced his grief. Listen to 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 19. Your pride and joy, O Israel, lies dead on the hills. Oh, how the mighty heroes have fallen. Go down to verse 24 through 27. Women of Israel, weep for Saul, for he dressed you in luxurious scarlet clothing, in garments decorated with gold. Oh, how the mighty heroes have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies dead on the hill. He faced his grief with truth. They really were dead, and he felt it. But he also faced his grief and expressed it openly. Actually, he wrote a funeral song for Saul and, and for Jonathan, and he told the nation to learn it and, and to sing it with him. It's recorded in verse 17 and 18 of chapter 1. Then David composed a funeral song for Saul and Jonathan, and he commanded that it be taught to the people of Judah. David faced his grief. He fought with his grief. He was challenged by his grief, but he never denied his grief. So if we're going to successfully deal with our grief, there's some things we need to realize. Number one, we need to realize that grief takes time. Grief takes time. So give yourself plenty of time to grieve. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 and verse 4 deals with this. It, it speaks of this time factor. Listen, it says, For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to cry and a time to laugh, and a time to grieve, and a time to dance. Different cultures express, around the world express their grief in different ways. Egyptians are known to wear black for six months. Muslims are known to mourn their loved one for up to a year. Orthodox Jews offer prayers for the deceased for 11 months. Ethiopians, when they lose a loved one, they will grieve up to three months and some longer than that. Everybody grieves differently. You know, there is no standard measurement of time. This is how much time you have to work through your grief. There is no measurement of that. See, the time required to work through your grief, it's gonna be different for each person because each person is different. And nobody knows how much time you're gonna need. You don't even know how much time you're gonna need. But do this, allow the time, take the time, give yourself plenty of time. And if you, my friend, are around somebody that's going through this grieving process, give them grace and give them time. Don't try to hurry them along. And as you grieve, as you grieve, be open and honest with God and, and with the people that are around you. Maybe an uncomfortable question, but let me ask, are you angry with God for what's happened, for the loss of your loved one? Are you upset with him? You need to tell him. You need to be honest about it. Tell him. He already knows it anyway, and he cannot help you work through your anger at him until you admit that you're angry. Are you tired of telling people you feel fine when you don't? Be honest with them. If they ask you how you're feeling, tell them how you're going, how, what you're feeling at the moment. Tell them. I read the story of a couple whose teenage son was tragically killed in a car accident. They held his funeral on the following Saturday. On Sunday morning, this couple got up and, and dressed and they went to church as was their custom. And when they arrived at church, somewhere during that time they were there, someone asked them a question. 
Now, before I tell you the question that was asked of them, let me, uh, let me tell you, I, I don't believe that the person who asked this question was trying to be rude or insensitive or I, I don't believe that at all. I, I mean, you and I both know it's, it's hard sometimes to know what to say to somebody that's working through their grief. You know, truth be and wisdom would say your silence and your presence probably speaks louder than anything that you would say. So here's the question that was asked of this couple. How are you guys feeling? How are you feeling? The husband has been on edge ever since the news of his son's death. And then he kept it together all through the week and he kept it together through the funeral and, and through the cemetery. And this question is too much. It pushed him over the edge and he responded with clenched teeth and tear-filled eyes. He looked at the person and said, how do you think we feel? How do you think we feel? We just buried our son. How do you think we feel? My friend, face your grief with tears. Let them flow. It's okay. Face your grief with time. Take as much time as you need to work through it. And face your grief with truth. Be honest about it. And, and remember this, my friend. God has the last word on death. God has the last word. For believers, our loved ones may be absent from our presence, but they're not absent from God's. Uh, while we stand grieving at a grave, they're celebrating and experiencing all of the joy and the glory that heaven has to offer. And my friend, whatever you do, whatever you do, do not speak. Do not speak of your loved one in past tense term. In other words, he was such a good man. She was such a good mother. Don't do that. Truth be told, they're more alive now than they've ever been. They, their pain is gone. They don't hurt anymore. Everything that was wrong has been made right. And life for them has never been better than it is right now. So when grief comes as a result of a death, within your circle of loved ones. Grieve. Grieve openly. Take the time you need and be honest about it. But grieve with hope. Grieve with hope. I, I want you to know, my friend, you can talk to God about your feelings as you go through your grieving process. He understands those feelings God knows the sorrow of a grave. He buried his own son. He knows what you were feeling in the cemetery. He knows. So you can talk to him openly and honestly. But listen, God also knows the joy of a resurrection. The joy of a resurrection. He raised his son to, to life again. And, and through your faith and by his power, you'll know that joy as well. And so will your loved one. So grieve with hope. Grieve with hope. You know, in reality, life is very short. Very short. And it's lived at rapid speed. And the Bible speaks about this. In one place, you'll, you'll see that the Bible says that life is like a vapor. It's here one moment and gone the next. In another passage, you'll see that it's referred to as life is like a disappearing shadow, a passing shadow. It's here one moment and then it's gone. I, I think one of the great explanations of, of this is in Psalm 39 verse 5. Listen to this. You've made my life no longer than the width of my hand. 
My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. Wow. Listen to that again. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. Do this with me. Take a deep breath. Now slowly let it out. That's it. That's the length of the span of your life when it's compared to just the beginning days of eternity. It's here one moment and gone the next. It's gone the next. Let me ask you this. When it's your time, when death comes for you, will you be ready? Will you be ready? If you're a believer and you've asked God to forgive you of your sins and, and you've, been, you've given your heart and your life to Jesus, my friend, you are ready. You're ready. If you're not a believer, and if you have never asked God to forgive you of your sin and, and given your heart and your life to Christ, my friend, you're not ready. You're not ready to slip from this life into eternity. You're not ready to stand before God. Let me just be dead honest with you. The horrors that await you on the other side of your death as an unbeliever, they're unspeakable. They're unspeakable. Oh, I want you to be ready. I want you to be ready. If you are with us today and you've, you're not a believer, you've never given your heart and life to Christ, pray this quick prayer with me. Just pray it out loud. Lord God, I come to you and admit I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sin and I give my heart and my life to Jesus. Thank you for loving me and for saving me. My friend, if you prayed that prayer with me just now and you meant it from the, from the bottom of your heart, you just became a believer. You were born again. Life for you and eternity for you just changed. Some of you are with us today and you've lost a loved one and you're going through a grieving process and you're hurting you're hurting L let me let me pray for you my father i come to you in jesus name and i bring my friends with me and lord you know some of them that are with us today they've they've lost a loved one and and they're hurting they're grieving inside and it just seems like it's never going to end. It seems like the sun's not going to shine again. It seems like time has just stood still. My father, you know what they're feeling because you felt it too. You know the sorrow of a grave. You know what they're going through. And, and I ask you, I ask you, my father, comfort them. You're the only one that can reach down into the depth of their heart to where they're hurting. Our words are meaningful, but only you can comfort them in this time of their grief. And I ask you to do so. I ask you to make yourself known to them. Let them be so aware of your presence that it'll be like a, a warm blanket has been wrapped around their shoulders. Thank you for loving us. Thank you. There's a promise of a resurrection. Death isn't going to have the last word on any of us, our loved ones or ourselves. And I thank you for it. My Father, do for my friends what they cannot do for themselves. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you my friend. Thank you for listening to this week's message. 
To stay up to date, please like us on Facebook at Touching Africa Ministries or visit our website at touchingafricaministries.org. If you would like to give online, head to touchingafricaministries.org slash donate.